it's raining outside. So we're going to do a test on a focuser and see just how good or bad it is while uh, we build our next setup for the spring. My, I'm a part of an observatory. We have a lot of experienced astronomers there who have many, many years of astronomy under their belt and have a lot of experience with a lot of different gear. And I remember we bought an RC for the, the club and for our, our new astrophotography setup. And many of the more senior astronomers there, when they noticed that a GSO focuser came with RC, they all kind of rolled their eyes and said, oh, that's a GSO focuser. <laughs> so, now, I looked at the focuser and I was like, oh, it seems like a good focuser to me. I mean, it looks pretty solid, you know, it looks nicely machined, everything, you know. Just... And it wasn't until I actually took one apart that I then saw why so many astronomers didn't like this focuser. To illustrate this, you can actually see the bottom here, there is a linear rail, which, which is what I've got here. Now, now this one's a little bit different. This, is, this one actually has a four ton capacity. <laughs> it's a really beefy one. It's out of a CNC machine. And this one also has four sets of bearings. The linear rail that is in this GSO focuser, uh, which this one in particular is branded scope stuff, has just two, two raceways. Now, when you have four tracks, okay, but you have, you have four different directions that it presses on this linear rail. And what that means is that no matter what direction you try to like twist this thing, it's going to come into contact with bearing head on. However, when you just have two tracks, you only have two directions of pressure. Therefore, the bearings actually have to deform as they rotate in order for the linear rail to have any kind of preload to it. All right. Now, and, and this is kind of, we're gonna get into kind of like why, why this focuser is not the world's best focuser, but we're gonna see how good it is here when we test it in the shop. Uh, imagine this here is your actual focus tube, like kind of similar to this right here. Basically, the entire focuser is just attached down there by the actual track. Like there's there's no other types of support whatsoever on the focuser, and and it's not the greatest pick of linear rails it is, is. Now, this is a Crayford style focuser, which means that it doesn't have any backlash whatsoever. So I'm not really even gonna bother testing the backlash. But what we are going to do is put some poundage on this thing. We're gonna put two pounds in each direction, all four directions, and we're gonna see what kind of flexure this focuser has in my machine shop. If there's any terminology that I use here, uh, I would encourage you to go watch my video where I tested the focuser on the Sharpstar 120mm Apple or Ascar 120mm Apple. And in that, I kind of explain a lot of the terminology. So here's the setup, kind of a lot like last time. This shade, by the way, is an integral part of this particular scope. It's glued in place. So I kind of placed my weights up here a little bit further just to give me more leverage on the tube. This is our sanity check here. Uh, it's very similar setup as last time. We're on top of my granite plate here, and I've got, these are 40 pounds a piece, and they're on each side to kind of basically keep the tube from actually moving. And I got a little bit of weight on top as well. Now, the focuser, I set it to a distance where it's actually about in focus for this particular telescope and focal reducer combination. And, and then the tension on the underside, I placed at about what, or actually what I'm going to use when I, uh, when I put my autofocuser on here. There is a locking knob on the top here as well. However, I don't lock this when I'm doing astrophotography. So I am gonna keep that unlocked. Uh, everything else is locked in place. And then our first test we're gonna do is we're actually gonna see how much flux there is in this tube, just kind of for our sanity check. We're gonna put two pounds of pressure on this. And as you can see, that's about six thousandths of actual bend in the actual entire tube itself. Because right now the indicator is actually on the focuser body itself, all right? And if you remember last time, 
the sharp star focuser that we tested, everything was about four or five thousandths or less at the extreme, okay? And I think the tube on that one actually only flexed about a thousandth or so, or less. This time, I've actually got the dial indicator on the actual focal reducer, and we're actually gonna see how much flex there is in this assembly with two pounds of pressure coming towards you, all right? There's two pounds right there. So that was, that was about 10 thousandths, which is actually less than I was expecting. We are now set up on the opposite side of the focal reducer, and we're basically gonna go the other way now. And once again, we're gonna do two pounds. All right, so it looks like we actually went beyond the range of my indicator. We're gonna have to get a coarser one here to, uh, to actually get a real number on that. This, this is a dial indicator. I, the previous one I was using, technically, this is a test indicator. So uh, this one has a much greater range though. So let's go ahead and do this test again. And I'm sure this time we'll get us a complete reading here. So there's two pounds. That was about 22 and a half thousandths. And then the spring back on this, it stayed, it looks like about six and a half thousandths in the direction that we actually pushed it or pulled it. All right, now this time around, you're gonna get kind of, the, this is gonna be the easiest one to view, just for the nature of geometry and everything. But we are going to pull up this time and see what we get. Once again, two pounds, all right? Ah, surprisingly not as much. Uh, that was only about seven thousandths, two thousandths of memory where it, it didn't go back that far. So I've reset zero and we're gonna do our final test. Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add two pounds of weight to this assembly. And there, that's about, that's about, it's still going. <laughs> Close, that's three and a half thousandths right there. Which was expect, it's expected that that number will be lower because the scope is already loaded in that direction. And as you can see, we had about one thousandth of memory where it didn't spring back all the way. All right, all right. so I hope you found that interesting. And yeah, that's kind of what you can expect from a GSO focuser. It's a little bit haphazard as to which direction we were going, like how much you know, flux we actually saw. But anyways, this scope, by the way, if you're kind of interested and curious about this scope, this is actually an Orion 120mm F5 Acromat. And, and I carbon fiber wrapped it with uh, some vinyl that I had at work because I like white scopes, I don't like black scopes. <laughs> and then I, of course, put the GSO focuser on, which was a pretty easy uh, slap on fit. So Lostron has sold this scope with their own brain on it. Skywatcher has sold their own, this scope with their own brain on it. And of course, Orion has, and I'm sure there's a few others that I don't know about. But yeah, what I use an Acromat like this for, and this guy's pretty fast. It's F5 or F4.3, you know, which for, you know, a three or $400 scope used, that's really, really cheap. And what I do is I use very, very narrow band pass narrow filters. They're, I think, three and a half nanometer botters. And when I shoot narrow band with this guy, the fact that it's an Acromat doesn't matter, okay? Like you can, I basically get to great stars and great images out of this guy, and I can do them very fast too. I can get exposures pretty quickly with this guy. If any of you are kind of curious about swapping out focal reducers for other types of scopes, or other scopes I should say, there are just three things that you really need to take into consideration. Number one and foremost is that you're putting your focal reducer behind the same kind of optics. In other words, you wouldn't want to take a focal reducer or comma corrector for a Newtonian and put it behind a, a refractor, okay? Obviously that would not work. Now, uh, the second thing you need to take into consideration is the focal length has to be the same, okay? This guy has a six millimeter focal length and the scope that this focal reducer is designed for has a 600 millimeter focal length. So they were a great match for each other. And of course, lastly, try to kind of keep the number of lens elements that were 
in the system are for the original design the same. So this is a doublet, has two lenses elements in it, and the scope that this was designed for also has two lens elements in it. Now one of them's ED in that case, but close enough, okay? Now, I got one thing, I'm actually kind of curious, although I'm pretty satisfied with this rig, uh, there is actually a 150 millimeter version of the F5 Acromat out there made by Celestron, I think. And I think Skywatcher may have even sold them for a little while. I'm actually curious if it would work with this focal reducer. Uh, that might be something I experiment with in the future. We'll see.